Hello everybody, welcome to IT Security Labs and I'm very excited today because it has been two weeks since we attacked a machine and actually did some detection. So as you all know, this is the most exciting stuff that I do. I get a lot of adrenaline rush just learning new things and I hope tonight you are going to have fun as well as we take you through the journey of learning about local file inclusions. As you know, local file inclusions affect at least three of those OASP top 10 and they are prevalent out there. That's why in our attack and detect lab today, we'll be focusing on them. So here's the structure of what we'll be doing tonight. We'll start with enumeration. So we'll enumerate a Linux server. We'll try to identify the web application that is running on that server. Then of course, we'll find which part of that application is vulnerable to log of our inclusion. And then we'll do some previous and, <coughs> excuse me, for the most fun of it, we're going to look at what does that look like on the wire? What does that look like from the host? I already deployed a server with a Wazoo agent. So we have both network intrusion detection system as well as host-based intrusion uh, happening, which is very exciting for this lab. So thank you very much for joining me. And if you're brand new here, my name is Howard Mukanda, and I have been doing this for at least three years now. I've gotten some certifications to try to help me with my knowledge. I'm still learning just like you, and this by far is the best way that I found for me to learn how to do these things. I have a lab environment that I set up. This is pretty much close to what you uh, will be seeing. We have a security onion intrusion detection system, which is the secret source to everything. We have a Kali Linux machine here, and all of our virtual machines run on VMware SXI. This one is a host, is an agent just running on a Windows 10 machine. So we have like a virtual box running on this Windows 10 down here. And this virtual box is bridged network. And we can see everything that's coming from Kali down to here. And that's how our detection works. So without wasting a lot of time here, let's jump to our lab environment. First, we'd like to confirm that we are actually seeing some traffic. So you can see here, this is our Kibana for Security Onion. I've seen some. I was do, just doing some testing here. We see some alerts. We probably want to change this to the last two hours, maybe one hour, so that we don't index a long time. And then, of course, we have the regular Security Onion interface here, which is showing our alerts. So this is the most exciting stuff here, being able to see alerts triggered after we have um, attacked the system. Because while you can go out there and attack all systems you want and hack the box, try hack me or Vaughn Hub, if you don't know what that is, what is happening on the network, you're almost like someone who's just, you know, shooting in the dark. You really need to understand if I run a script that I borrowed from someone from the internet, what is that script going to look like on the wire? And that is one, one of my passions and I enjoy being able to see that. So. That's what we're going to be doing here. I'll jump to our Kali Linux. The first part is enumeration. We need to identify what is running on our host, what, is, what, what services do we have. So I try to use nmap minus sv for service versions, minus sc for service scans. Let's do all ports so we can generate as much noise as we can. Then, of course, uh, 192.168.38. This one is running on 86. I already found it from my DHCP server. So on 86, let's find out what's running there. As we run Nmap, one thing that we need to understand is uh, finding service versions uh, and using default scripts can cause a lot of noise on a network. So you do this if you're not worried about getting caught. If you don't want to get busted, don't run with this uh, species here, especially this that uh, scans all TCP ports. It definitely makes a lot of noise on the network. So, and it might take a while. For us, we'd like to come back here and let's refresh our intrusion detection system. If you have never seen Nmap in action before, just know that it's a very loud tool. And Anyone with an intrusion detection system that's worth a grain of salt will catch you. They will definitely catch you. Whether they will respond to that, uh, that's a different story. But so you can 
tail, you see all these ET scans here? That's all from NMAP. Like I've been doing this for a while now, I know right away if I see a bunch of ET scans, suspicious inbound, especially these ones, I know someone is running NMAP with a default script. It's probably someone like me who actually is trying to learn or who just hopped on someone's network and they're really not uh, worried about getting caught or they don't know what they're doing. But if you are curious, I think if we drill down on one of these, we should be able to tell uh, for web traffic, usually it's like uh, user agent is NMAP. But for this one, yeah, this is just Suricata catching the ET scans. It th thinks it says VNC scan. Yeah, which is, which is what it is from NMAP. So let's, let's let it um, run and see what we found here. Lucky for us. After scanning all TCP ports, we found only one port, which is port 80, which is unusual. Most of the time, if it's a Windows system, you'll find yourself with a lot of ports and a lot of output. So port 80 is good for us. So we just open a browser. Let's just go to our site, 192.168.38.86. Now we're just um, enumerating our target manually. So this is interesting. It's a very simple web app, blank, then uh, upload and language. You can view page source to see if there's any funny scripts that are running in the background. In this case, on click uh, language.php. So we do have an upload and language, which we saw here. So let's try to, yeah. So if you go to the upload button, we should be able to browse and upload an image. Let me just try to find if I have any images here. In my documents, I might have some, no? All the images that I have are fake images, <laughs> my JPEGs. I actually don't have an image on this Kali Linux machine. Okay, let's just pick on one, uh, this one, bedshell.jpg. So the upload was successful. So we know we can upload images. And it tells us, hey, your uploaded image went to this location here. So if I wanted to, I can see if I can just get to that location. Of course, that's, that's not a real image. I had made up a, an extension there trying to bypass the site. OK, so it uploads images. The idea here is if someone created an application that accepts people to upload images, they should check user input, meaning if someone uploads an image that is not a JPEG, PNG, or any of the extensions for images, they should be told they can't. That means that if I try to upload a PHP script, it should tell me to get out of there. Uh, let's try to upload a document, a Word document. Exactly. So this is good. They are doing some user san um, input and uh, they're checking to sanitize input and also uh, validating what we are uploading. So that's interesting, but that will not stop us from bypassing this. We can use Burp Suite or we can just um, try uh, common ways that you can bypass this. And I'll be showing you in a second here. Let's check for robots.txt. I don't feel okay if I don't check for those. Uh, I'm not even going to run go bus on this one because I'll be interrogating the file upload. Let's check for, let's just check the language. So I'll open this in a new tab. Uh, or just open it here. Okay, so here's language. So if you click on language, this right here in your URL should scream local file inclusion. If you see this, the first thing that comes to mind is to check for local file inclusion. Is well, they're saying language is equals to something. So can I do the classic local file inclusion? And I'll tell you why you would do this. Most of the time, websites reside in such such var, such www, such HTML. So you are. Uh, 
three away from the root of the Linux file system. So if you put dot, 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 it will take you back to the root. Then you can go to Etsy password. So we will do that. So it's one, two, three. I think three should take us back. So Etsy pass WD. If this doesn't give us any, we just add one more just in case we're in a custom directory. But this is how you can quickly check to see if this is vulnerable to local file inclusion. And as you can see here, it is. We found this by just clicking around a website. Nothing fancy here. Usually you have to fuzz for this language uh, parameter here. Um, you can use wfuzz for that, but today we're in luck. We just did that. So if you want to see this in a nicer way, I like to view it as a page source and try and understand, okay, when I look at these users that I found on a Linux system, I'm looking at the user IDs. Um, if you are not familiar with this, if any user that's above 1,000 uh, with a user ID, they are regular users and anything under 1,000, they're like system or sometimes application. So this user here, Basam, is a valid user was they are the 1000th user which is which tells me this was the first user to be created on this system and they have been bash so as i attack this system i keep this in mind i have a valid user that i can work with but some all these other users here the user ids are below a thousand they're like users that are created by applications uh for things to work like uh ww data is for web applications and things like that so this informs me 1,000 and above are interesting users. So Basam will remember that name <coughs> in a little bit here. But we have local file inclusion. Um, there are certain files you can look for, like uh, log files, like Apache log files. Can You can access them from here, which will be um, interesting to find, again, valid usernames. But getting Etsy password is good enough. So... We can do local file inclusion. We can upload an image. That's a recipe for uh, disaster for us, right? Coming back to our um, Kali Linux here. I'm working in a directory called Kira in, in my machines um, directory. And I already downloaded um, PHP reverse. So this is from Pentest Monkey. So if we do, let's use nano so that it looks nicer. This is the default Pentest, um, Pentest Monkey PHP reverse shell. Since we want to go straight to uh, command execution, all we need to do is change the IP address here, which I think mine isn't changed yet. On your Kali, you can just do an IPA. This is your IP, 192.168.38.34. So we come back here. Uh, we, all right, 34. All right, let's use the classic port. I'm doing this to cause as much noise as I can because 444 is usually the default uh, reverse shell port. So I'm hoping that will do. Uh, since I'm using nano, I need to do that. Make sure that I didn't put anything interesting in there. All right, now I just need to Make sure that this PHP reverse shell is uploaded to the site. Here comes the problem. The site is checking for JPEGs, PN, PNGs, and uh, GPAG uh, files, not PHP. Definitely not PHP. So, so what I can do is I can just copy this to my home. Let's put it in my documents. So I'll copy that PHP reverse shell and name it um, hacked.php.jpg. So this is just stacking the extensions here to try to fool the upload feature that they have. It will still upload my P 
PHP reverse shell by just putting the JPG and the uh, PHP there. It's one of the classic things that, that you can do to start. It doesn't always work. You might have to encode things. You might have to do other gymnastics here. But uh, for now, we just save that in my documents. All right. Coming back here, let's upload, browse, got my document, and here's our interesting file. It's showing as an image, but we all know it's a P, uh, PHP file. All right, but before I do that, let's start my netcat minus LV and P on port 444 that we just created. Then, um, once we upload, it says it's done, which is good. And it tells us, oh, your upload can be found here. There are two things that you need to understand here. We already know we have local file inclusion here. We can use this LFI now to access our recently uploaded file, or you can just go directly. But for now, I'm just going to... Let's just use exactly what we have for LFI. If it doesn't work, we might have to find the path. All right. So now we're like, okay, that didn't work. Since it told us exactly where we were, I'm just going to remove all this and just put it right here. That's good, it's spinning. And we got a reverse shell. So we just used local file inclusion to get um, a reverse shell. We could have got a remote code execution uh, in a browser. But for now, we got a reverse shell. First thing is, of course, ID. We are this useless user, WW data. Useful for us in a little bit here because we can um, pivot from this user to a more privileged user. So where am I? I'm in mean the root for WW data. Okay, um, let me make sure that this shell that I got here is stable. So do I have Python? So maybe Python 3? Yeah, Python 3 is there. So let's go and stabilize this shell uh, with Python 3. And for that, I like to be on autopilot. I'm no, I really don't like to struggle with the syntax of how to stabilize the shell using Python. And that's how you do it. Then we do an export term. This shell is still a little bit unstable, but it's better. The, I've seen uh, people do more to their shells, but for me, as long as I can clear my screen and I can move around without any issues, um, I like that. So since we're WW data, it's kind of useless to even try to look for SUIDs. Most of the time, you won't even find any. Um, but it's interesting to go to most uh, interesting directories, like home. And like we found out earlier, Basami is a valid user. I'm interested in what Basami has been running. I can see that there's a user.txt. But of course, we can read it according to these permissions. So Basam is interesting. I can try to look at the, their bash history, see what they ran, if I could read it. <laughs> but in this case, we can't. So this is not nice. Let's go to where the website lives. Let's see if the website has any um, databases or anything interesting, like or configuration files that may leak credentials. Um, usually it's HTML and there we go so this is our upload.php this is where our uploads are and we have super secret for Aziz this is some CTF stuff usually you don't see this uh, on real website so in our uploads as you can see this is where we kept all the different uh, shells that uh, we are uploading using JPEG, okay? If you wanted to look at the logic here to see like how we are verifying 
that is in um, it's a PHP. You can read this file. But I'm interested in this secret file here. It's a folder. It's so let's try to get in this secret folder and find out what's in there. Most people will have maybe backups. But this time we just have a text file. Again, this is a classic capture the flag stuff. I don't know anyone, I mean, there are some people out there who do this in production, but we get a password. We have a user that we know called Basam, and we found the password by just poking around. So I guess the one thing to take away from this is always enumerate, always um, look around before you start running tools. It would be easy to just run uh, like a new for Linux, but if you have a website, go to www and see the logic of the website. What were they doing? Are there any comments in the code and things like that? So for now, let's switch user to that Basam user. And we'll put this password here. By the way, we are monitoring everything that we're doing right now. This process of switching the user, there's a Wazoo agent on this system that is logging everything that we are doing. So in a little bit here, we'll go and try to find out what did it log? Did it find out about anything that we did here or not? Okay. So if we go here, we have a, looks like we have a full desktop here for Ubuntu. This is our first flag. So if you want to hack the box or try hack me, you'll be submitting this one. But for now, we're going to say um, sudo minus L. Do we have any sudo permissions to do anything? Maybe we're part of the sudoers file, then this machine will be done. We do not have um, the full sudo permissions but we have the find and we can run find the command with any and this is a classic one if you find any sudoers you go to uh, in this case gta4 bins we can run find and we can run find with sudo and it will be like hey uh, if you can run find the binary uh, with sudo you can be dropped into elevated privileges by just running find exec bin sh and quit. So we'll get a shell from this. This is like a, as easy as it can be on CTFs. All right. Where am I? Now we are root. CD such root. Get flag the text. All right, so the privilege escalation not so interesting, not not so much there, but the LFI stuff that we did earlier, that's interesting. One thing that we can do before we leave here is let's do something like um, let me show you like if you were to fuzz for LFI, I have a W fuzz here. Yeah, if we were to fast for LFI, this is how we would do it. And this will generate even more noise. And I'll explain the syntax in a second here. All right. So let's, uh, let's assume our website didn't tell us that language was the parameter. We didn't see a question mark here. But we wanted to find out, is it language? Is it file? on any of these parameters, which is most of the time you have to fuzz for LFI. You would run this command here. And what we are doing here is we're using a tool called wfuzz, and we're looking for an, a file, folder sometimes, and we're using wait list, uh, medium.txt, and we're looking for status code of 200. Uh, this needs to be tweaked most of the time. Then we'll go to our site to say, okay, this is our URL. 
language.php, but we don't know what it is because most of the time you don't. So you put the word fuzz here. Then you put your Etsy password at the end. So you can fuzz for local file inclusions using this method here. The only problem here is if you put Etsy password, you are going to be caught by intrusion detection system. This is where uh, I think tonight's live stream is interesting because as you fuzz, uh, we, we have already triggered the alerts by just uh, doing it by hand. But I wanted to show you this. This is a tool that a lot of people would use uh, when they're doing bug bounties or some, sometimes they use uh, Burp Suite. But right now we are fuzzing for the parameter for local file inclusion here, which we already know is language. Let's go back to our intrusion detection system. Okay, this value here is at 21,758. <laughs> Let's see if we refresh and see um, where it goes to. And then we can go through how local file inclusion could be detected and which parts actually get triggered for people when they try to do local file inclusion. Okay, now it's at 22,000. So we have already gotten 200, I mean, uh, 1,000 entries. Let's refresh that again. Twenty two two ninety four. Does it go up? It should. All right. So maybe, maybe it's done. Oh, oh no, it's it's still going. So Elastic Search has to index that. But as you can see, this is us fuzzing for that uh, look of our inclusion parameter. I'm going to stop it here because. We probably need to look at uh, the, the number of characters here. It's 203. We need to look for anything that's not 203, and then we'll be able to find it. So from what we did with the web attack retained 200 uh, code here, if we drill down on this one, this is when we're fuzzing for local file inclusion. What happened? How did we detect this? And what does that mean for you and I who are interested in attacking without getting caught or who are interested in detecting these types of attacks? That's the interesting stuff now. I think I may, might have been overloading my security onion. I'll wait. It's indexing thousands of entries, but that's fine. So this shows us it's a brute force, obviously, for local file inclusion. It's fuzzing, which is what most people do. Uh, from this source IP, from this IP address here, which I think is yeah, that's the source IP. This is our Kali Linux. Let's look at one of the entries. The severity is classified as low because sometimes legitimate traffic looks like fuzzing for uh, LFI. But look at this in the full log here. This is a log file. It was a get, and we put an abstract. Later, something here, and we're going to Etsy password, and it was WFuzz with its version at the end there. So if people were using Burp Suite, you'll probably be able to tell uh, from the user agent as well. All right, that's the first thing here. If people are fuzzing for local file inclusion, we should be able to catch them because there are a lot of people, they try to look for Etsy password, which is how this matches. How did this actually... Um, get classified by our intrusion detection system. Uh, according to the matter tactic, it was initial access. Uh, initial access, I think it, it actually is a number. I found it on the matter site. It was this one, exploit public facing application. Uh, it was T1190. So this is so how the attack is classified where an adversary may attempt to take advantage of a weakness in an internet facing, if it was internet facing in this case, um, using software, data, or commands in order to cause unintended or unanticipated behavior. What we're trying to do here is see the contents of the Etsy password. So that's how it's classified um, from Security Onion. I was more interested also in looking at the rule that fired, and I found the rule 
on GitHub. And this is how it's written in the Wazoo agent. If you want to create your own rules, I can show you where you can find the rules. Uh, in your security onion, which might be interesting for you as well, it's this directory. It could be in one of these folders. So let me do a PWD. These are the rules that come with the um, intrusion detection system. When you update them automatically, if you want to put custom rules, you can put them in the local rules.xml file. I don't have a lot in here, but the goal is for us, the more we understand about this, we should be able to go and say, oh, this is what the traffic looks like. Uh, right now, I just have a test rule in here. But this is the format that the Wazoo rules are put in place. They're easy to understand. And if you're not familiar with them, you can always borrow the um, open source ones and then the goal, with the goal of understanding how they are created and that, how they're working. So that was um, the first thing that we saw is if you do any form of fuzzing for local file inclusion, you're going to trigger that generic rule within an intrusion detection system. But we did more than that. We got a reverse shell. We also um, uploaded a file. So maybe I should just look for the file that we uploaded. For that, I like to use Kibana in the discovery here. This is by far not <laughs> the most elegant way of finding stuff. But as you can see, this is when we ran our scan, our fuzzing. So our, from our baseline here, this is the normal. Then, of, of course, then we spike. So if your, if your analysts were not paying attention, at least the people who manage this intrusion detection system here would be like, hey, something is funny is happening here. Look at all these events here. 65,767 in a very short period of time. So this will still be an indicator of compromise if somebody's brute forcing, trying to find things. But let's find our um, bad shell. Uh, was, what was the name of that file again? Let's find it. Okay, let me just look for all PNG JPEG files here. You will not be able to do this in a big environment because this will lock down your database. I'm only, I'm only doing this because I can. It's a very tiny lab environment. But um, here's a few files that I uploaded, like hacked.jpg.png. I like to do this because then I can see um, what was on the wire on the network. In this case, most of the time, I'm going to see Zeek uh, files. And I'm also going to see some something interesting like this. So this came from var log Apache 2 error.log. So this is an error file from the Wazoo agent. So if they have host-based intrusion system and it's looking at default Apache logs in this case, it will be able to tell that a file was uploaded. In this case, it's a JPEG file. And it says hacked.jpg which is uh, interesting. So what this tells me is from the same file that uh, alert that we saw here, I bet it's the same location. The log that, that triggered all this noise here. It's the Apache log. So what I like to do after knowing that is this Apache log that's doing, uh, giving us uh, things, I like to go to the system and look at that log file. Is root, I should be able to just go and find that log file and so it was, um,
Let me see other logs that are there. So the error log is the one that did that. So we should have the auth log as well. So here are all the logs file log files. The error log is where what we we got from it. This is the access log. Let's see if any entries to pass WD showed up there. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Okay. <laughs> Let's get access.log and grab pass WD. All right, so we did it many times. So this right here is all the brute forcing that we were doing. It shows up in the access.log. Then the Wazoo agent passes through this access.log and reports on it. That's actually uh, how everything was happening. In that case, we can ver verify because all the alerts that we saw had the same entry here that included the past WD. So that's how the Wazoo agent was able to identify LFI fuzzing um, using the access.log, which is, I think, very exciting and interesting for people who want to learn uh, purple teaming or just red teaming or just defending. When alerts fire, we need to know, okay, where did that alert come from? Was it a network event? Was it a host-based event? If it was host-based, was it because a log file was passed or was it a behavior that we generated? In this case, we are coming from access.log when we fuzz uh, Apache application. So if I next time I'm going to be running any tools against a website, I'm going to be aware that there is this file called access.log for default Apache applications that are running, and you might get caught if they are running uh, an intrusion detection system like what we're doing here, which I think takes us way further from just like you know your regular CTF stuff or uh, your regular just detection stuff. All right, that was how the Wazoo agent was able to uh, detect us from this access.log, and you can see um, we have a lot of in entries there. Let me, let, let me, let me just look for that past WD. I, I'm curious how many times this is going to show up. It should be one of the big entries. And by the way, like I said earlier, this is a lazy way of interacting with Kibana. You need to narrow down your queries uh, because this can cause database parsing issues when you look for uh, wildcards like I'm doing. All right. So as you can see, we have 3,000 entries, 3,300 3, within just a small period of time. <laughs> this shows you that this SC password here was being trying, somebody was trying to access it so many times. And as you can see, this is a telltale sign of a tool like WFAS being ran and somebody trying to uh, brute force. You can tell that uh, we're just changing this value here until we get, it, we get a hit. So maybe it's smart to not brute force people's stuff because if they are detecting you, they will be able to see uh, what you're doing. All right, so that was one, running tools know what they're doing. Next, let's look for the reverse shell on port 444. What does that look like? Did we trigger anything? Okay, we only did it a, a few times here. And it looks like it was only Zik. Oh, no, so we got it. Excuse me. Suricata did catch it, which is good. So 
Suricata is so uh, is Suricata rule fired for this one, which is more interesting. I think it's that default port four four four. To be honest, if I had changed the port to like four four three, I don't know if this rule would have fired. But we'll see. Okay, so this actually <laughs> had nothing to do with the port. Uh, we got an alert here that said something like um, GPL attack response because we ran the command ID. You see how silly this is? You, you immediately, after people <laughs> um, attack a system, they run the command ID or who am I? And that command, of course, in this case, <laughs> triggers this generic rule here. So this has really nothing to do with our reverse shell and LFI. It has something to do with what we did after we uh, got our access as root. And it's kind of silly because it only fires when the user ID is equal to zero. So it doesn't fire when it's WW data, which I think I should have a rule that fires for everybody. But this one says, hey, if you see a user ID equals to zero for root, and the command ID was ran, um, maybe someone is doing something funny. So that's how this rule um, <laughs> came about from Suricata. When you go to our reverse shell, then the other ones are just a uh, connection that uh, bro so. Let's look at this one. Okay, so this one said connection rejected. That's interesting. All right, so the one that I was mentioning earlier, I realized that I was in the way. This is what it looks like. And this is how it's looking for the user ID. If you look in the message here, part of the content that this rule is looking for is looking for the user ID equals to zero, which is root or root. And after command ID has been ran. So that's unusual, and we got caught getting a reverse show, which hopefully if these people were paying attention, uh, would have been caught. What else did we trigger when we were doing our shenanigans here? Let's go back to our alerts. Looking in the last hour. Other than this noise here, sudo. Did I run sudo? Yeah, we did. So we're monitoring. I hope that this also adds value to you as far as like understanding that if you have host-based intrusion detection, you're going to have a lot of noise. So tuning these rules is going to be important, but also having host-based intrusion detection for Linux systems is very, very interesting. Okay, so this one identified it as a privilege escalation tactic which is exactly what we were doing. We were doing privilege escalation. Um, it found out that we ran the command sudo as basam. The command was list. So this was um, our privilege escalation that we did from basam to root. So we also got busted on that one. We would not have been uh, identified if we did not have host-based intrusion detection system. So. That's interesting. Sometimes I like to go and look at the rules themselves, see like how they were written. But in this case, our previous got busted. Our initial access got busted. What else <laughs> went wrong here? Yeah, this is the same as the, the one that we talk about, successfully changed use ID. You're probably going to see Oh, actually, <laughs> this is different. This is when we switched the user from uh, Basam to, I mean, from WW data to Basam. I don't know how useful this rule will be by itself, because in real production environments, people do switch users all the time. Um, people run commands as sudo all the time to do management stuff. So this might generate a lot of unwanted noise but this will be helpful if it's you know part of a whole story where you have seen local file inclusion then you're investigating but 
this alert here could be noisy for a lot of people. It could generate a lot of um, unwanted alerts. So maybe event correlation <laughs> comes in place here. If you can correlate things, this is where things are, might be interesting. All right. I think I, I saw what I wanted to see. Let me know in the comments if there's anything you'd like to see. But I think I truly think that this is by far <laughs> the most exciting thing that you can do and for your learning as well. To throw in a vulnerable machine, even if you know how to attack it, and just do it with the intent of seeing oh, what noise am I going to cause here? What kind of ruckus can I do in an environment? Because these alerts, the way they get triggered is the same exact way, regardless of whether you're using Security Onion or you're using Splunk. It's alerts, traffic, host base, and everything. I'll, I'll just check some uh, comments here. I see BT is here. Thanks, brother, for joining. And Infosec Pet, thank you for being here. If I eat, I say, uh, this is really dope. Yeah, this is uh, exciting stuff. J Swiss, thank you all for being here. I hope you learned something from tonight. If you joined up late, uh, it's a very short stream. I encourage you to go and watch from the beginning. You will definitely like some of the things that we did tonight. Once in a while, I like to pull PCAP and you know, interrogate the handshake and maybe see the files that were um, downloaded. But let's assume we wanted to send some files to our, um, let's say, malware analyst or somebody wanted to see like, oh, what file, what, what was that file that we uploaded? Let's, let's assume we didn't know the contents of the JPEG file. We can track it down and download it. And I like that part because most of the time when people deliver malware to your environment, you want to know what was that. And if you have qualified malware analyst, they will be able to break it down for you. In this case, we just have a silly JPEG here. Let's see if we have a unique identifier for it and try to, ah, we can actually just use this one, the underscore ID and hunt for PCAP or in cases. So let's find out. Because most of the time you don't even know the payload that they uh, put out there. Samba, it's good to see that you uh, finally were able to join. All right, so let's um, go to actions. Give me a PCAP. Ha. This one, Elasticsearch didn't find it. Let's find a different one. Uh, let, let's make sure that we uh, we we look at one that actually worked. This one established. All right, so all we need is to find the, a proper file when we did a get. It's usually like an, a URI. Shell was not a good idea. URI. HTTP URI contains star.jpg. This will give us the actual files when you saw them in the URI. And here's our hacked file. It's a GET request. We like that. Um, this is when we clicked on the file, but this is when we went to the uploads. So I like the first one. All right, I think we will get lucky with this one. Hey, Rashid, how, how is it going, man? I hope um, if you are interested in setting up your own lab environment, uh, feel free to follow. I have a series on this channel, the Home Lab series. It will show you how to set up 
uh, a Windows Active Directory environment. And hopefully that will help you with um, setting up your own lab. But most of the time, if you have never seen PCAP in your life, this will be a good place to start because you generate your own PCAP, you know what is in it, then you download it, then you go and see it. In this case, I look for a PCAP file that contained our malicious uh, file that we uploaded for LFI. And as you can see, we can see the who done it. <laughs> I like to call the TCP handshake, uh, the who done it. I really need to get out of the way. So you can see scene, scene arc, arc, the, then the finish here. Okay, who did it? Where did this come from? We can see the source here. Let's open it in Wireshark, the classic uh, file. We're going all the way in today, all the way from delivering a payload to downloading our own payload as well. So that's kind of interesting. All right, now we have Wireshark up. Mine is color coded. So this is how we can see our traffic. So we can see the machine, the destination. I'm so I'm, I'm resolving uh, usernames here. And this is the file that we did a get for when we triggered our reverse shell. As you can see, it was this hacked uh, pick up the, the JPEG. So if I wanted that file, I can try to see if I can export the objects. I think I have the HTTP objects. And it, since, since I can find it in this one, I just have to pull another picket. But uh, in this case, I don't think it's necessary. You already know that it's a PHP file, but this is what it will look like from a PCAP. And everything that you saw here, we did it live. This PCAP wasn't there before we started this live stream. So this just goes to show you that most of these things that you will be seeing at work or if you are like just learning uh, these things, you can practice them by yourself. You can then show up to an interview. They're like, hey, if you worked with PCAPs, you can tell them how you generated PCAPs and you're able to actually see uh, the transactions as well. There's another way you can import PCAPs as well in Circuit Onion, but for now, this is um, exactly how things work. I think um, that was a lot <laughs> for one night. Thank you all for being here. Give me a thumbs up if you haven't. Uh, if you like this content, also remember to subscribe to my channel. Uh, we have, I think, 30,000 or 31, if not 32,000 uh, subscribers on this channel. It's a very niche world that we have. So to have 30,000 people subscribe, that means a lot. So thank you for subscribing and being here. We'll definitely be doing this next week, next Sunday as well, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll pick on one of the OWASP top 10, go to town like what we did today, and hopefully you're learning something. If you need any help, let me know. Um, otherwise, thank you all for being here, and I'm hoping to see you next Sunday. Thanks.